I've got a, uh, an introduction for you this morning that, quite frankly, I'm not quite sure I'm going to be able to get through it anyway. So I've been in a, in a crying mode all day today, all morning. Uh, I don't know why, but I just, I am. I, how many of you are familiar with uh, Tim Tebow uh, and his wife? Um, you know, Tim, Tim was an athlete, is an athlete really still, obviously, but he won the Heisman Trophy at the University of Florida came out uh, to play football for the uh, Denver Broncos, for the New York Jets, a few things. But because of his faith, uh, he uh, was really at that time oppressed. See, today we give our athletes a forum to share what they believe. Back then, it was not so much. And he had, uh, you know, the the black underneath his eyes with John 3.16 under there. <clears throat> and so on. And he would have a different scripture depending upon where he was uh, at the time. He and his wife have an organization called A Night to Shine the Light. Well, really, A Night to Shine the Light of Christ uh, is what it's called. And I want to share with you a testimony uh, from a mom back in 2021. I, I don't know what church they were at, um, but he does these uh, nights to shine all over the world, and churches participate so that uh, parents' children who have special needs would have an opportunity one time in their life, if that be the only time, to shine and to be heroes and to just be celebrated uh, for who they are. So I want to share this uh, testimony with the excitement swells up in the, th- in, in the threatening to knock me down into a blubbering mess. Mm. As we enter the parking lot, we seemingly float through a sea of enthusiastic well wishes holding glittery welcome signs that beckon us to join them for an adventure. Emotional surges are 100% in the forecast for this mother of a child with Down syndrome. The cheering continues. Blake is already feeling the love. Masked volunteers whose smiles cannot be hidden direct us to drive in a circular pattern through the adjacent lot. And Blake's special evening, however, has only just begun, and we already know he's going to emerge as a crowned king. Timidly, we we pull up to the first table uh, set aside uh, for the honored guests. This is Blake's first night to shine. So, um, I'm sorry. Uh, This is Blake's first night to shine. So I trust my best to follow directions and not uh, miss a cue. I I give the volunteer Blake's name. He's on the list. He's counted. He matters. The volunteer brings out a large 8 by 10 uh, name tag with Blake written in big, bold letters and places it on the passenger side of my desperately in need of a wash windshield. And then it hits me again. The ocean waves of tears. We drive past what seems like masses of people holding signs of encouragement, cheering and calling out to my son. Hi, Blake. Way to go, Blake. Have fun, Blake. Hi, Blake. Yeah, Blake. And a few feet away, we pause while we, while another volunteer hands Blake a a beautiful, elegant white rose tediously garnished with a hand-tied black, white, and aqua bow. More cheers, more signs, more excitement. As we press toward the next table, stationed around the semicircle, volunteers bestow upon Blake his kingly crown, silver plastic and adjustable yet simultaneously regal and befitting for a beloved child of the King of Kings. (laughs) 
Blake's radiant smile emerges as it's fitted onto his head. We slowly continue our short trek, desperately trying to soak in every iota of the heartfelt sentiments and attention. And to the left, a band bellows out a familiar praise and worship tune. And their voices add a welcoming pomp and and circumstance to the already electric atmosphere. Countless volunteers hold up signs that state, you are loved. You're special and way to go. And to the right, a little farther down, a, a photo op. We, we pause uh, uh, so I can uh, hand my uh, phone uh, to the designated photographer while her accomplice holds up a night to shine frame who snaps a photo of Blake through the open window. As we round the bend, I sense that Blake's fun-filled adventure is about to wind down shortly. And as the old saying goes, well, time flies when you're having fun. Slowly, we pass by more smiling faces, more clapping hands. We, we wave again and again, uh, mouthing thank you, while savoring the moment and bursting at the seams with gratitude. Another table. Another gift, a swag bag. Blake agrees to wait until we arrive at home to reveal the treasures inside. Suddenly, I notice someone to the right, paparazzi. A woman with a camera runs down the sidewalk toward each car, excitedly attempting to capture photos of the kings and queens as they pass by. Moments later, we spot the last table filled with stacks of metallic catering containers. Is this what I think it is? Are they providing us with food as well? I slow down, a bit confused, worried that I am... I am being uh, presumptive. Well, a gloved volunteer walks over and and asks ever so politely through the passenger window of uh, if she could um, uh, place the containers in my trunk. Yes, absolutely. This is music to a tired mother's mama's ears. No cooking, no grocery store. They even made dinner. Waves of tears rush in again, but I hold them back mostly. The remaining multitude of Blake boosters, including the head pastor of our host church, guides us out of the parking lot with a full heart and ear-to-ear smile, so very thankful that for a few glorious moments, Blake was loved, honored, cherished, sought after, lavished with gifts, and celebrated. I glance over at the newly crowned king, who is still basking in the richness of becoming royalty for an evening. He looks at his rose, breathes in deeply, smiles, and half whispers to himself, I so have. Every time I've read it, <laughs> it's taken me down a path I really didn't think I was going to go down. I read that and I thought to myself, what Christ must have felt like as he overlooked the city of Jerusalem and the multitudes were screaming, Hosanna. And they, they placed coats over a donkey and they threw palms down before so that the hooves of that donkey would not touch the ground. That the king had arrived. We go through life, and all through life really, 
there are occasions or circumstances that cause us to cry. What causes you to cry? It's Palm Sunday. We're we're 2,000 plus years ahead of what has already taken place. And yet, there are houses of worship that are empty because people don't recognize the king had arrived. If you would open your Bibles with me, we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke this morning. And uh, Luke is a little bit different. You know, we talk about the Gospels quite a bit uh, and how uh, varying accounts take place in each of the Gospels. Uh, What's important to Matthew might not be quite as important to Mark, and what uh, was not important to Mark might be very important to Luke. And and John, uh, he was just a different kind of guy. We're going to be in chapter 19, Uh, and um, from a background standpoint, uh, I'm going to kind of survey the beginning of the chapter for you just to lead us into where we're going to be, but our our main text this morning is going to be uh, chapter 19, verses uh, 41 to 44. So let me read with you. If you feel so inclined as to stand for the word of God, uh, then I encourage you to do so. Beginning in verse 41, chapter 19, the gospel according to Mark, I mean Luke, uh, when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground and your children within you and uh, level you to the ground and your children within you and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. That's God's word this morning. Um, Our um, sermon title, um, if you haven't guessed already, is A Night to Shine. Um, There's so much going on in this particular chapter. You know, Jesus had been teaching and... um, There are two different spellings to um, this story that I'm going to share with you. Zacchaeus, or Zacchaeus, however you uh, choose. Uh, Some spell it A-E-U-S. Some just spell it E-U-S. I'm a Zacchaeus kind of guy, um, as opposed to Zacchaeus, but that's okay. And who was this, this wee little man that I promised I would not sing the song? Um, but who was Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus, 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 you say potato, I say potato, but here's the deal, the real deal behind it. He was a hated individual. Nobody wanted to talk to him. Why? He was a tax collector, and he was a little bitty guy, and he hears that Jesus is coming. Who is this this Jesus guy? I got to see him for myself, and what does he do? He climbs up the what? The sycamore tree, right? Climbs up the sycamore tree just so he can get a, a look see. And people just constantly, you know, putting him down and all this stuff in the multitude of thousands that are there. What does Jesus do? Hey, Zacchaeus, come on down. Points him out by name, invites him in, t- and Zacchaeus brings him into the house and they break bread together. What is the purpose behind this? Christ was revealing himself as to who he really was. And he shares the gospel with Zacchaeus. And what does Zacchaeus do? He pays back all the wrong that he had done, multiplied time, you know, multiple over what it was that he actually had stolen. He gave it all because of the gospel 
the good news of Jesus Christ. And although other people sneered themselves and, and, and pushed away, Christ said, no, there is not one who is not deserving of hearing the good news of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done in your life. It's irrelevant. Let me say that again. It is irrelevant. Why? Because Christ is calling you. And he says, no matter what you have done, if you repent of that, you're going to be okay. And that's exactly what he does with Zacchaeus. And after he has this encounter with him, he starts to teach again. And he talks about the parable of the minas. So for those of you that know, there's this landowner. And we're kind of like a king of a region. I have a friend of mine who is from Nigeria, and he's the king of a region, uh, John. Um, he's, uh, uh, he's king in this region in Nigeria. He's a major in the United States Army, and he's uh, part of, uh, he and I go back a long time. Interesting. But this guy is a king, and, they, and he gets called away uh, to another land because they're going to make him the king over that land also. And he leaves some of his slaves in charge, and he gives each of them money. And he says to them, listen, do my business while I'm gone, and, and then I'll be back. And all of a sudden, all these people come in, and they can't stand this landowner, and they're giving him a hard time, and, you know, and all this stuff. And the slaves are trying to do what they need to do. The king does his business at this other kingdom, accepts whatever it is that they had given, and he comes back. And he starts to talk uh, to the um, slaves, what have you done with what I gave you. And each one of them, and I'm, I'm really condensing this, but each one of them gives an account of what it was that they did with the money that was left for them. Here's the thing. This is such a statement for the state of affairs that we are in today in our country, okay, and even in the world. He, he says to, to the one who did really well, hey, you know what, you turned it into 10 and doubled what it was that I gave you. I'm going to go ahead and put another 10 on top of that in the sense that I'm going to give you 10 cities to rule over. Another one, you know, and it goes down. And then one guy, he just kind of wrapped it up in cloth and he put it in the ground and didn't do anything. And he said, look, why didn't you do something? Well, I was afraid. And this, he says, you know what, you did the wrong thing. You, God doesn't tell us to sit on what we have. God tells us to multiply what it is that we have. And so what does he do? The landowner takes that away from him and gives it to somebody else. And they're right away, oh, that's not fair. Well, what's fair? He says, those who have little or nothing and do nothing with it will continue to have nothing. Those who have much, I'm going to multiply what it is that they have. That's the complete antithesis of where we are in society today. See, if you don't have anything, you're entitled to have whatever it is that doesn't belong to you. Okay? And if I give you something, it's your job, not my job, to multiply that for you. And so we go through, he starts talking about this. Why, and I've got a method to my madness this morning as we move through this. But he does this whole thing, and then he comes to this point where he knows what's going to take place. And why he's leading all of this, this parable leading up to what? To the Pharisees that are in Jerusalem and who have separated themselves and made it about them, and everything is mine, 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 mine. Okay, and there's bickering amongst them. There's no peace, and all of this is going on. And Jesus had pointed all of this out as the reasoning behind why this was occurring. And so in verse 28 of this chapter, after he had uh, said these things, he was going on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. He said all these things knowing what it was that he was going to have to face. And he says, in, uh, skipping down a little bit, but uh, well, in verse he says, when he approached Bethpage and Bethany near the mount uh, that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples, and here's where the process begins. His disciples go in, he tells them, hey, listen, there's going to be this donkey, there's going to be a cult. 
Tell them who it's for. Bring it back to me. No one has ever sat on this cult before. Bring them back. I'm gonna, this is what I'm going to use to enter into the city of Jerusalem. And they, they listen. They go, are you sure? Yeah, don't worry about it. You listen to what I got to say. See, that, that's the other biggest problem that we have as human beings. We're not obedient. Right? We always think we got something better. Uh, if we would just do what we're told to do, we'd be in a way different place than we are today. And so they, they, they are responsive and uh, they are uh, listening uh, to what it is that uh, uh, Christ is, is telling them. Uh, and uh, as soon as he uh, was approaching near the descent of, Ma- of the Mount of Olives, in verse 37, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud no- uh, voice for all the miracles which they had seen, shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace and in heaven and glory in the highest. Hosanna. Sound familiar to our introduction this morning? Here, here's this, this unblemished, perfect, in the eyes of God, being praised in a way that he would never have been praised before. Christ came as the, as the sacrifice, as the offering, perfection given to us, fully God, fully man, all in one, and here he is dressed and ready as people stand, the paparazzis in the first century, well, more like a hammer and a chisel as they were uh, getting uh, all of that going, screaming out, yeah, go Jesus, go Jesus, the king has arrived. You see, in Judaism, they think of the, retur- uh, of the, the coming of the Messiah as being a militaristic uh, thing. They, they don't think of it as, as Jesus, a carpenter, the son of God, the sacrificial lamb to take away the sins of the world. That's what leads us into him standing at that moment before he goes into Jerusalem. Now, first point this morning, flashing lights. I I took a lot from, from our introduction. But flashing lights, here's the approach He stood looking over the city. He knows what he has to do. I I tried so hard during my time of study to reflect and try and put myself in that position. And I couldn't do it because I'm a sinner. And he was perfection. And he stood over it and he looked upon the sin of Jerusalem or really the sin of the world. And he said, I'm going in to the lion's den. And I'm going to do something that's going to change the course of eternity. For so many who will ask for his forgiveness. And you just got to ask. People used to say, it's just so easy, just to ask. And I would laugh. I would laugh. I'm like, hey, I'm having too much fun. I'm not ready for that yet. I'll get around to it. Maybe not. You know? I mean, amen? I mean, it's just, it's it's mind-boggling to me where we are today to think that I ever even thought like that. Just a short while ago. So in our first point, what we see is the approach. He stood over the city. And he's looking out at them, and he knows what he must do. And here's the kicker in verse 41. This is the thing that just changes it all. Because in the New Testament, there's only one other place that this takes place. And if you look at the gospel according to Mark or anything, they don't mention any of this. He wept. Jesus wept. Not for himself because of what it was that he was going to do. He wept over the sin that was ruling over the people of the world. 
the divisiveness that was taking place in Jerusalem between the Gentiles and the Jews, between the Jews and the Jews. He wept over the fact that there was a polytheistic approach to what God is. There are multiple gods. I'm going to build a wooden thing and I'm going to look at it and say, that's my new God. I'm praying to that. And Christ comes in, he says, I am. I am. Which is the same thing that God said to Moses. He said, I am. And Jesus repeated it. How many times did he repeat it in the gospel according to John? Seven times. I am. I'm the bread of life. I'm the resurrection. I am the light of the world. I am. I am. I am. And so he saw what it was, and he wept. He wept. In the Gospel according to John 11.35, chapter 11, verse 35, is where we see the other time that he wept. And what was that over? It was over his friend Lazarus. That, that's what that was about. He, he knows the fate of those who do not believe. And he knows about the hate that exists today in our world. And I never thought I would say this, but there is, there is real hate that is happening today. You, yeah, you think, is it really possible? It's okay, we might disagree on something, but that's not what it has become. It, 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 is, it is a true hatred um, if you don't believe somebody else's truth. And I'm not just talking about non-believers. I'm talking about believers. There is a great fight within Christendom today over things that mean absolutely nothing at the end of the day. I don't care if you're a five-point Calvinist. We're not going to fight over the fact that that's happening. I'm not interested in the fact that it's Reformed theology. What I am interested in is that the fighting that goes on within Christendom has to do with the way that we are treating one another. And that's a problem. We, we want to hide the sin instead of exposing the sin and call for repentance and forgiveness because God has promised us forgiveness. In Luke 13, I, I just want to take a quick, quick gander at it. Luke 13, chapter, uh, uh, verse 34. Um, it says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her, how often... I wanted to gather your children together just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you would not have it. This is what he's thinking as he looks over Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. just don't get it. That's, that's what's going through his head. It's like, I just don't get it. See, we look at, 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 at quote-unquote Easter and, and Palm Sunday and this Holy Week. You know, for most people who call themselves Christians, it's all about the eggs. It's all about the candy, and it's, it's, it's what it's about. And we seem to forget what really has taken place. And I, I don't mean to beat you up over the head about it, but, you know, I, I lived a life that was so far separated from Christ that at the moment of my conversion, I could not think in my mind, how could I not worship this living God? How did it take me so long to understand the despair and hurt that he was feeling when he looked into Jerusalem and saw the disarray, the disconnect, the hatred that was going on, and all he could do was weep.
We always want to do it our way. Christ weeps for the fate of Jerusalem and the people of Israel. You know, Jerusalem, if you go back to Jeremiah, uh, we, don't just, we just don't have the time this morning, but if, if we were to go back uh, to, to, to the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 8, and you might want to write this down, just go back. Th- this idea of what was taking place, remember, he was a pre-exilic uh, prophet, right? Jeremiah was warning Israel, look, look at what's going to happen if you don't pay attention. He goes into Jerusalem and all the things that they did to, to Jeremiah. And yet Jeremiah was faithful, thus says the Lord. So go back and read this, but in, in Jeremiah chapter 8, verses 18 through 21, and chapter 9, verse 1, you understand that where Jerusalem was back then, you understand where Jerusalem is with Christ, and you can see where, where Israel and Jerusalem are today with all the crazy that is going on. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. I don't know how else to say it. Here's my second point, verse 42. Um, a mask of deception. If you think about uh, the uh, introduction and all these people had masks on and they couldn't, they couldn't, even with the masks on, could not hide their exuberance for what is taking place. And I, I think to myself a little bit differently in that the people of Jerusalem were wearing a mask and they could not see the truth of Christ. And yet they were screaming like they were happy. They were exuberant. All these great things, but they did not see Christ. They did not see the truth. They did not understand the sacrifice that was taking place. They did not realize that they could be forgiven for a life that was completely devoted to sinfulness. And yet God, in the midst of all of that, said, I forgive you. Yesterday when we were celebrating David's life, David Arnold, I said there was a verse in in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. People don't want to hear that because that means that there's a way out. They would rather wallow in the sin that they were in. In Jerusalem, this is what's going on. A mask of deception has taken place. He goes, I'm bringing you peace. I'm going to bridge that gap for you. And he goes, you don't see it. How many of us sit in churches today and have masks on our faces? Don't see it. We don't see it. We're praying to things that have no significance whatsoever. We we should be praying to the living God. He says, talk to me. I don't want religion. I want relationship. I don't want you to say, I'm a Baptist. That's not what he wants. He wants you to say, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. That's who I am. He doesn't say, I'm a Lutheran. He doesn't say, I'm a Catholic. He doesn't say, I'm Episcopalian. No, he says, I'm a believer. And that has nothing to do with man-made religion. It has to do with a personal, intimate relationship that you have with Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. And so these masked, this mask of deception, the people exhibited the parable of the menace. They, 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 there, was no, there was no growth in their life. There was nothing going on. You didn't think I'd come back to the parable, but I'm coming back. The people established, exhibited the parable of the minis, the money. Man-made religions, power, a man made religious power finally separated the Jerusalem establishment from God. That's where we are today. That's why you see so many pastors falling right now and having moral failures, financial failures, embezzlement, all that kind of stuff is going on. Why? Because they somehow have elevated themselves above where they're supposed to be. We should be bondservants of Christ Jesus, not the other way around. 
Okay, I don't care how big the church is and how much money you're bringing in, quote unquote. That's not what God calls us to do. God calls us to be bond servants. The apostles themselves called themselves slaves of Christ. They had been set free from the bondage of sin to do what? To be a slave for Christ. That was the freedom. That's the mindset that we must have. That's who we are in Christ. Stop listening to the religious uh, uh, Pharisees that are out there today telling you you have to be in this particular uh, religion. You know, you've got churches, quote-unquote evangelical churches, that unless you're baptized in that church, you're not saved. Last time I checked, baptism has nothing to do with your salvation. You make a personal choice to follow Christ then you get baptized. Why? Because that's your profession of an internal transformation and your profession publicly of what took place internally. You have churches out there that say if you do not speak in tongues, you haven't been baptized, I'm not going to say slain in the Spirit, but baptized by the Holy Spirit. And if you haven't been baptized by the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues, you're not saved. You have people that say, no matter what the Scripture says, they say, if you're not doing all the things you're supposed to do, you're going to lose your salvation. None of that is scriptural, my friends. None of it. But this is where they were in that first century. This is what had taken place with the Pharisees. There was this decisiveness. They thought they were more than what they really were. And so his revelation no longer came to them. They didn't see it. And, and how long are you going to reject him? That's my question. The question to the world today. How long is it going to take before you realize the error of your ways and you call upon Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior? Religious, uh, um, I'm sorry. Um, these are the things I say, I, I've said it a thousand times already this morning, but it's what we experience today. We have a total shutdown of God in our society today. It was a total shutdown of God back then as well because it all become man-made nonsense. Religious establishment covering their eyes and rejecting the truth. And like the parable, they would rise up in outrage. It's unfair. Why are these people, right? See, Christ came to bring peace to the Jews because of the infighting that was going on. And then he brought the gospel, the good news to the Gentiles. Why? So that they might be grafted into the family. And they're all crying, but we're the Jews. We're the chosen people. Why? Well, you know, like the, the, like the parable before, if you do nothing with what I give you, I've got to move on. I'm going to give it to somebody who's willing to do the things that need to get done. And that's where we are, right? Like, like that parable. God gives them what they deserve. No more responsibility and privilege from those who misuse it. And we must learn to recognize what? Recognize the truth, the Savior of the world. Zacchaeus, what did Zacchaeus do? He repented. God blessed him. He realized who the Savior was. Here's my last point this morning. Because I, I say to you, can you realize, will you realize who the Savior of the world really is? On this Palm Sunday, just before he enters into Jerusalem to experience the Last Supper, to talk about the fact that he was going to do something that they couldn't come with him to do, that he was preparing things, that he was going to sacrifice himself for the love of you. And me, Oof. if that doesn't get you to well up, I'm not sure what will. Here's my third point. The party is not over. It's time to shine. It's time to shine. And in verses 43 and 44, the days will come uh, <clears throat> is what he's saying. He's saying looking at uh, AD 70, remember that's when I think it was Nero who c destroys the temple. And destruction of Jerusalem, rather. And, and this is about the gospel going now to the Gentiles. 
party's not over. You know, just because you don't want to believe, you've been given the opportunity. And just because you don't want to believe doesn't mean it stops. God is going to move forward. Our goal is always to go forward, no matter what. If you're in the midst of the pit of hell, in, in a valley that you can't possibly think of how to get out of, God says, here's my hand, start walking, because we will come out to the other side. What's the old adage? You, if you're not going into the valley, you're trying to get out of the valley. If you're getting out of the valley, you know that, hey, it's good for a minute, but you know that you're going back into the valley. That's life, right? I mean, it's just the way it is. The, the, the thing that makes it different is that we've got a Savior who's taking us by the hand. Even as I read in, in, in Psalm 23 yesterday, he leads us to quiet water. He's not going to let us go. He's going to take care of us. And even though I might think in my mind, yea, that I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't, feel, I don't fear evil because thou art with me. That's what we're talking about. And you should get excited about it. And you should feel good about it. And you should know that Jesus lives today. And we're going to talk about it over this Passion Week in such a way that others will come to know that same truth. In verse 44, what we find out is Jerusalem would be leveled. They refused to see God's glory manifested in his son, Jesus Christ. They, they would not give God the glory. The church today does not give God the glory. They give their pastor the glory. They give their worship leader the glory. That's why these men and women who are leaders in the church are falling by the wayside because we have forgotten who deserves the glory. All right, so I'm pounding a little bit. That's good. Um, it's Palm Sunday. It's what I do. They would not give God the glory. The Messiah had come, and they were blind because of their own desires. That's where we are today. Our desires are trumping Jesus Christ. It's time to get over it. It's just time to get over it. We're so hung up politically today over the, everything that's going on in our country, but that, those politicians that we are angry with or not angry with or whatever it is that you are, okay, it is a direct result of our inability to recognize that it is Jesus Christ who is on the throne. And as a result, our environment is dictating who these people are. I'm going to close this morning. I know it's before 12 o'clock. Call me crazy. What do I know? I'll hang for a little bit longer just so we can go over. <laughs> hey, I want to say this to you in a, in a very positive way. It's time to shine. It's time to shine. Um, T take, take the masks off your face. The party's not over. Turn that frown upside down. No gloom and doom in this place because Jesus is alive. Jesus has revealed himself once again. And the day of visitation that was meant to fulfill Israel's hopes and expectations would instead bring God's judgment on them because they didn't take the mask off. We have an opportunity today, and I wouldn't be Lenny if I didn't walk you through this, but we have an opportunity today amidst this ever-changing world to be a light. You can do it. I, I think back to David, and you heard, those of you that joined us for, for his celebration of life yesterday, you heard people get up and say he, he was the most humble man you'd ever want to meet. Not, not a cross word came out of his mouth. He, he wanted to help others in, in time of need. 
and, and, and whatever the scenario was. That, that's who we need to be. Take, take the mask off, humble yourself, and be a light amidst the darkness. Our friend David was a light amidst the darkness. And again, for those of you that weren't here yesterday, every seat was virtually filled to celebrate his life. I'm not going to eulogize him again, but he will be dearly missed. There are, are, are many who are blinded by the world. And as I said, take off your mask so that you may see Jesus uh, may see Jesus came to save who? He didn't come to save those who were saved. He came to save the lost. And that's what we have to think of. It, it, it is true, no matter what your life looks like today, he offers you eternity. He wept over Jerusalem because they refused to shine. And they would not take off their masks and for them, for them, the party was over. For us, it's starting. Remove your, your mask. Open your eyes. And be saved. How do I do that, Pastor? I've messed up so bad. Nobody loves me. I deserve to be in the pit of hell with everything that I have done in my life. Jesus has a different message. He says, if you would admit all those things you just admitted to me, admit to him. Repent of that sin. Turn from it and say, I don't want to be separated from Jesus anymore. I know that he lived. I know that he died. I know that he rose. I, I need Jesus in my life. My friends, you will be saved. And your eternity secured. You, you will be sealed into the book of life, the Lamb's book of life, your name. I'm curious to see if mine's going to be written in Hebrew or if it's going to be, you know, if I get my Hebrew name or if I get, uh, you know, for those of us uh, who are, are, are of the um, love language of Spanish, it is said, I can neither confirm nor deny because I haven't been there yet, but it is said that the language of heaven is Spanish. I don't know. We're going to find out. You know what I think? I think it's going to be like the day of Pentecost. Everybody will hear in their language. And it'll be something spectacular when people of all types come together and worship and sing out, Hosanna, Hosanna. Let me pray with you. Father, and Cliff's going to come up. We're going we're gonna to have a time. I, I, I want to really invite you uh, this morning. Um, if you need prayer in your life, Come down front. Pray with me. You know, the, the prayer of a righteous man avails much. Not that I'm a righteous man, but when, when, when God brings believers together, when God brings people together to pray, th there is great things that happen. If you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, then I want to encourage you today to make that decision. You've, you've heard the sermon. You've heard the gospel. It doesn't matter where you were. It's about where you want to be. And if you would just recognize and turn from that way, then you can be saved. The Lord spoke in Second Chronicles 7, 14. He said, and he's talking to the nation of Israel, but if, if those who are called by my name would turn from their wicked ways and humble themselves and cry out to me, then I will hear from heaven. But you, you, you have to humble yourself. And so as I pray, think about that decision in your life. 
And if you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, then I pray that today would be that day. If, if you feel as though you've wandered away, invite him. I say invite him, but talk to him right now and say, look, I, I, I messed up. Can you forgive me? And I know what he's going to say to you. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of those sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, right now, Lord, I, pr I pray your hand upon each and every person in this sanctuary. I pray your hand upon those who might be listening, watching, and, and uh, frustrated over where they are in their lives that perhaps you would bring them the comfort that they so desire, knowing <clears throat> that they cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna. They don't want you to weep over their lives. They want you to rejoice in the knowing that they have turned from a life that is separated to you to a life that is complete in you. And I pray and ask this all in Jesus' precious name as we pray and have a moment together.